Hi, I'm Diana Gonzalez. And I'm David Janot. We live, work, and play in one of the most beautiful cities in the country. Yes, we do. And to keep Miami beautiful, we have to keep it clean. In this special, we focus on a variety of efforts by city departments, from parks to police. You'll see your tax dollars at work. Let's start with Public Works and the Scavenger 2000. I'll take you aboard as it cleans up the Miami River and Biscayne Bay. For more than a decade, the Scavenger 2000 has been working to keep City of Miami waters clean. With the flick of a few switches, these two large arms, or bow doors in front of the decontamination vessel, open up and guide surface debris in. Then, it's all scooped up from the water and dumped into the trash bin. This is a sole source, you know, uh, technology that was developed here in Miami. That's Sophie Mastriano, the president of Water Management Technologies, which serves communities and customers all over the world. She designed the vessel with her father and runs the business with her husband, Mark. I take great pride and I'm honored to be part of the Scavenger 2000 because as the city of Miami grows and the populace grows, it's just more pollution going into the water. And Scavenger is vital for keeping the city of Miami waterways clean so that our kids can enjoy the water as time progresses. Attila is the captain of the vessel, and every day from 6.30 to 11.30 in the morning, he takes the Scavenger 2000 out on different routes assigned by the city. Some go to Grove Key Marina, Dinner Key Marina, some go all the way up to 79th Street, sometimes it's a Miami River Day, sometimes it's Bayside. When the trash bin's full, the vessel's taken to Hurricane Cove Marina, where the trash is picked up by a forklift and transferred to a separate location where it's disposed of responsibly. Sophie, Mark, and the captain say over the years, the Scavenger 2000 has picked up a lot. You name it, they've seen it. Some of it very disturbing, but nothing the vessel can't handle. We usually dump about, uh, I would say about five to 10,000 pounds a week, and we've been doing it for 13 years, so do the math. It's a lot. We broke down the numbers, and that's equivalent to scooping up between 3.4 to 6.8 million pounds, or 3,400 to 6,800 grand pianos out of the water over the last 13 years. Not only does this vessel have the ability to collect tons of waste and debris from our Miami waters, it also has the ability, as you can see here, to purify the water using oxygen. That's where the magic really happens. The water enters a decontamination chamber where it's bombarded with ozone oxygen and UV light. On a smaller scale, this controlled demonstration shows how the purification process works. Okay, well, what we did is we deviated our decontamination system, a portion of it, and we uh, applied it to the, the bottle here. And within like uh, 20 seconds, 15 to 20 seconds, uh, we changed the color of the water, we decontaminated the water, and as you can see, it's much clearer than what it was before. On our newer model vessels, we decontaminate 20,000 gallons per minute. Over the years, the family-owned business has received a lot of support from the city and its leaders. Chairman, RE2 is a resolution whereby we're increasing the contract capacity uh, that we use in the city of Miami for the scavenger vessel from $650,000 to $700,000. This year, we approved in the budget uh, the extra $50,000 of uh, capacity for the scavenger vessel to operate. We had done that the previous year as well. This is great news for us. It shows that the city really loves us. First of all, the scavenger team are great partners. Uh, they're excellent contractors, and their contributions to keeping Miami beautiful are invaluable. It's great for the city too because it shows that they are really, really conscientious about being a green city and they are innovators, really. But city officials aren't the only ones that appreciate their work. Tourists and residents love watching the scavenger in action. The boat is a star in itself. When we go and we clean up, let's say Bayside, where it's a very large tourist area, They'll look at the mega yachts, they'll look at all the beauty of the boats, and then they'll see the scavenger, and they all are attracted to it, and they film it, they applaud us. It's beautiful, so it, me it really makes us feel good about what we do. This is what litter looks like on the street, 
in your neighborhood, in Biscayne Bay, and the Miami River. City workers clean it up, and it just keeps piling up. You can be part of the solution by tossing your trash into garbage containers and by recycling. Please don't litter. Keep Miami beautiful! Removing litter from the streets of Miami is the mission of the city's solid waste department. There's one employee here who's been working meticulously behind the scenes to keep Miami clean a few bristles at a time. Gutter brooms can get into the edges of a street and lift out the dirt and trash. While the street sweepers these brooms are attached to are very high tech, the brushes are assembled by hand. You have to set them up like that, you see how they all is set together. And then bring them down and I bend them, put it there and pull it back. Why is it dangerous? The wire, the wire. Montalan Agust wears special gloves and takes great care handling the bristles, which are made of steel. They're very sharp, very sharp. Once the bristles are in place, Montalan locks them in. The brushes have to withstand the pressure of scrubbing asphalt at high speed. Like anything that's abrasive in the street and you're going round and round and round, you wear out. So eventually it wears out over a period of time. Now if we use these, this equipment in the daytime and at nighttime, what's going to happen is within a month, we have to replace those brooms. Someday I make eight, someday I make 10, someday I make six. There are 14 sweepers in the city's fleet, but soon they'll be using pre-assembled gutter brushes. Montalan retired at the end of June, leaving behind a supply of some of his handmade brooms and pride in his department's accomplishments. We get the city clean. Now city Miami, much, much, much better like he used before. These street sweepers pick up 1.4 million pounds of litter each year. The Solid Waste Department, together with neighborhood enhancement teams and code compliance, have weekly cleanups in different areas of the city. Illegal dumping is also a big problem in the city of Miami. Not only is it an eyesore and a public health threat, it's also a crime. And when it comes to illegal dumping, the Miami Police Department is cracking down on those playing dirty in the Magic City. Sergeant Leo Topinus is in charge of the Police Department's Environmental Crimes Investigation Unit. We're charged with the mission of addressing issues regarding illegal dumping, dumping of hazardous materials, and working with uh, local, state, and federal agencies regarding environmental issues, specifically in the illegal, uh, illegal dumping. They work with the Environmental Protection Agency at the federal level, Fish and Wildlife at the state level, Derm at the county level, as well as co-compliance and solid waste at the city level. Sergeant Toppinus says some of the illegal dumping in Miami is just out of control, from raw sewage, food waste, and dead animals being dumped into the water, to hazardous waste and motor oil being dumped directly into the soil. Part of it is an educational issue. People don't understand that, you know, they have the attitude of, well, I'll just get rid of this here, it's not a big deal. Well, but if one person gets rid of something and the other person gets rid of something and then nobody takes responsibility for their own actions thinking that what they're doing is minimal, well, it all, it all piles up and then we end up with one humongous mess. Toppinus took us to Paradise Trailer Park in Alapata, which is surrounded by water. The stench was awful. The garbage, shopping cart, and bottles in the water, even worse. And then this happened. Okay, and see, perfect example. You have a dog that's now bathing in this water, which is obviously fetid. That dog now becomes sick. Now, heaven forbid, that dog bites a child, or even a child just goes up, or starts petting the dog, playing with the dog, and unknowingly contaminates themselves with whatever was in the water. Again, people don't take into consideration not only the immediate consequences, but the second, third, and fourth order consequences of their actions. Make you think twice when you want to pet a stray dog, right? 
There are three officers assigned to the Environmental Crimes Unit. One officer is assigned to each district, north, central, and south. They're tasked with checking the hotspots, and despite warning signs, they continue to catch illegal dumpers in action, as you can see in these photos. You get people that come over here and dump all kinds of different material because they figure, eh, it's okay, it's, it's a dump site. And look, specifically uh, posted, no dumping, but yet we make arrests here all the time. Why? Because they find it easier and cheaper to come over here and they figure, well, they're gonna get rid of it here rather than going to the dump and pay for it. Mario Nunez, the city's director of solid waste, says illegal dumping costs the city millions of dollars in cleanup costs, code enforcement costs, and law enforcement costs. And to help keep Miami clean and save up on cleanup costs, he says police are about to get a lot of help tracking down some of Miami's dirtiest dumpers with some high-end cameras. If people think they're not being watched, they got to think twice. Uh, the capacity, technological capacity, ability to determine where the source is coming from and who is doing it is, uh, is uh, beyond parallel. Nunez took us to a neighborhood and showed us this pile of random stuff. A domino effect he believes started with yard waste and clothes to eventually large pieces of furniture. Now you see this lot behind me is for sale, so there is no ownership on this. Uh, a, a perfect place to, to do the first dump. Then somebody else drives by, probably walks by, sees there's an opportunity to dump uh, more and more furniture. It really uh, creates a bad view. You also can attract rodents and other animals, and this is a public health issue. To avoid that public health issue, the city of Miami has a bulk trash pickup program for residents, which is free of charge and happens once a week. All they have to do is place their trash in a neat manner on the public right-of-way outside of their property after 6 p.m. the day before the trash truck stops by. There's also a drop-off site located at 1290 Northwest 20th Street. For hazardous waste, people can go to their home chemical collection centers that Miami-Dade County has available in the area. Nunez and Tapanis say unfortunately some people just don't care about where they're tossing their trash, and those folks will eventually face the consequences of their actions. When you have an area that is very clean, it actually helps increase the property values of the neighborhood. Nobody wants to live in an area that looks like, you know, a dump. It, it also not only brings up pride in the community, you know, that sense of ownership from people in the community, but there have been numerous studies made that once you do start cleaning up an area, crime goes down. Although all of the pollution we saw was disappointing, the city has made some progress. We've seen a dr dramatic decrease in cases of illegal dumping. We have gotten out, we've worked very hard um, over the last few years, over the last three years, to not only address the issues from a criminal standpoint, but also to provide education, to go ahead and start talking to, to these homeowners and these business owners, letting them know the impact. Toppinus says in late 2015, this entire block in Little Haiti was a complete dump zone. Junk and crime was everywhere, but something happened. After a camera was set up, residents took it upon themselves to block vehicle access to an opening where dumpers would normally pass through. A neighbor made upgrades to their home, and in no time, the landscape of the block completely changed. Look down that road, with just a little bit of effort on behalf of citizens, turn around, it's clean. A Little bit of investment, huge returns. That's what we're looking for. At the City of Miami, we want to encourage everyone to recycle, but I think there's a lot of confusion about how or what you can recycle, so our recycling coordinator, Katie Weyar, is going to help us sort through some of the facts and fiction about recycling. So I want to start with these plastic water bottles. Do you have to take off the top or not? Now, you used to have to take off the tops, but now uh, the way they process it, they kind of just pop off in the process, so it's not necessary anymore. Okay, great. So we'll put this in the recycling <laughs> bin. What about 
these sorts of cartons. Okay. So these sorts of cartons, they're called aseptic containers because they're covered with a wax film and they are accepted in our program. Just throw them in just like this as long as it's empty. Okay. Next, what about all this printed material we get in the mail? All of it. That's great stuff. So the more we recycle all kinds of paper, the more trees we can save, right? <laughs> paper towel. Cardboard. Paper towel yeah, so holders. it's all good. So all this, yeah? this is all good stuff to throw in there as well. Okay. All accepted. Paper bags? Yes. But you have one I see here that's kind of soaked in some grease, right? So yeah. that we consider that contaminated. Okay. And we cannot recycle that. Okay. So we'll throw that away. Okay. What about these boxes. They're good. These are considered a cardboard and they can definitely be remanufactured into something else. I have some pens. I think you have one <laughs> that are made out of recycled cartons. Okay. So. Now even this one that has a little bit of plastic yeah, and has fine. stuff in it. It's yeah? all fine. Yeah. All right. I'm curious about pizza boxes because a lot of people say you cannot recycle pizza boxes. True or false? Okay. So it's a matter of looking at the box. If you'd see it's too greasy, kind of like the bag I showed you earlier, uh, you want to toss that. Uh, I recommend, or the step that I personally take is I'll rip off the top because it's usually clean and recycle that and toss the, the contaminated part. Egg cartons. Some you can and some you can't right. recycle, right? Right. So if you see here, we have three different materials. This is cardboard, this is plastic, and this is styrofoam. Okay. We will accept the cardboard and the plastic in our program. Unfortunately, the styrofoam we can't. But there is something you can do with it. You can take it back to your local grocer um, or supermarket and they'll accept it there as well as plastic bags. Okay, yeah. This definitely doesn't belong in the blue in bin. In the blue bin. No, ne no kind of plastic no bag. Because sometimes I see people putting their recyclables in plastic bags and then putting it in the right. bin. Unfortunately, um, this will damage the machinery at the material recovery facility. So we ask people not to put them in there, but rather to take it back to the supermarket. And there they accept it and they process it for recycling. Is this recyclable too? Right. So we have all kinds of plastics in our home, in our okay. laundry room, in our bathroom, with our shampoo bottles, in the kitchen, with our maybe our detergent bottles for washing our dishes. All that can be recycled. All kinds of plastics. We would definitely want to throw it into the blue bin. So after we put all our stuff in the blue bin, then what happens to it? Okay. So the truck comes to your house, it uh, picks up your entire block, and it goes to a place called a material recovery facility which is also known as MRF. MRF, and there it gets um, sorted and segregated, processed and baled to get shipped out to an end user. For example, a soda company taking aluminum and remanufacturing soda cans. Okay. Everything that's on this table can be recycled. Keep Miami clean. Keep Miami beautiful, tropical and green. Keep Miami clean. Miami, Miami. Keep Miami clean. That music you just heard is part of a public service announcement that you'll get to see in just a little bit. Part of that PSA was shot right here at the Alapata Music and Literacy Center with some help from the kids from the Motivational Edge. Let's take a look inside and see what they're all about. Hey guys. So the Motivation Ledge is a culturally relevant arts-based agency and essentially we infuse the arts into lives of young people, into old people, um, and it's essentially for them to build a sense of confidence, find a platform for them to grow from. Ian Welch, a former school teacher in Miami-Dade County, is the CEO of the Motivational Edge and founded the nonprofit back in 2008. It's a safe place to go. You don't have to go home if you don't necessarily feel safe there. You don't have to go back to your neighborhood if you don't feel safe walking around the streets if mom or dad might not be home. So they come here, they're learning, they're safe, and they're really finding an outlet towards creativity. Right now it feels like family because I've known these people for a long time and they help us a lot. If you don't understand a problem on your homework, like math, they can teach you it or they can show you. They ask you how you learned it in school first and then they show you the same way or a different way and they help you with your homework and if you don't have or you finished, you get to do other fun activities. Over the years, the Motivational Edge has developed a large, diverse and dedicated team of individuals called teaching artists. Some have backgrounds in art, some in dance, and others in music. Alexander Starr is one of those teaching artists and used his skill in music production to create a catchy jingle for the city of Miami's Keep Miami Beautiful campaign. 
Miami, beautiful, tropical and green. Star mentors, young campers, foster youth, homeless youth, as well as incarcerated youth. And he takes a lot of pride in helping others with the power of music. And I think one of the greatest takeaways with them is uh, getting to getting to experience what they share through music that they would never share through conversation. That they would never share through a doctor with a clipboard asking them about themselves. Um, the musical approach is transparent, it's non-threatening, and um, it's approachable honesty. Rudy Sablon is the COO of the Motivational Edge. He says over the years, the program has become a dream come true that will have a lasting impact on these kids. The social return on what we're doing, it's something that we're gonna see a decade from now that these youth are giving back to the communities that they live in because they're now thriving as fruitful citizens, as musicians, as artists themselves, and now they're giving back. One, two, three, go. Keep Miami clean. Keep Miami beautiful, tropical and green. Keep Miami clean. Miami, Miami, Keep Miami clean. All right, then. Keep Miami beautiful. It's where we love to be. So keep Miami clean. Please keep Miami clean. All right, then. Keep Miami beautiful. It's where we love to be. So keep Miami clean. Please. The city is also trying to keep Miami green. In fact, our goal is to make it a lot greener. Take a look at what our parks and planning and zoning departments are working to protect. Does this look like Miami to you? Simpson Park is one of our local treasures. You're actually in a tropical hardwood hammock and Simpson Park hammock is truly an oasis in the middle of the urban core of downtown Miami. And if you want to really put it all into perspective, it's classified as a natural forest community. And Alice Wainwright Park, just down on Lower Brickell, is actually also a natural forest community. You're seeing original growth trees. You got the, the unique tree in there is the paradise tree, which is a champion tree. The great thing about a natural forest community, it's protected. So it takes in the fact that nobody's going to be able to come and arbitrarily take them away from us. While the Parks Department takes care of the city's natural forest communities, the Planning and Zoning Department's Environmental Resources Division manages Miami's urban forest. And our urban forest is, is all of the magnificent trees that you see in the city of Miami. And we regulate them, we protect them, we preserve them through our tree protection ordinance. When a new hotel was built in Brickell, this tree was moved across the street to save it. We have a bunch of construction going on, so it's, it's welcome construction. So we just, we just we coordinate with the developers and make sure that the construction is consistent with preserving our canopy. Here's a perfect example of how new construction can happily coexist with our canopy. So we have a goal to reach about 30% tree canopy coverage by year 2020. Right now we're at, you know, probably halfway mark, a little bit more than half that. We have a lot of planting projects that are in the works to help the city get to, to that goal. It's the leaves, it's the branches, it's the color, it's the roundness of, of a tree. And that is what provides us so many benefits, oxygen provides us shade, it provides a home for wildlife, you know, it provides so many benefits. So those are the things that we should look out and we should try to protect, you know, at all costs. We just showed you how the city is working to keep Miami clean and beautiful. But we need you to do your part. Don't litter. Please recycle and no illegal dumping. Let's work together to, to keep, keep Miami, Miami beautiful. beautiful.